the story, we turn to Bob Lee, who has brought along Jim Cott with him. Yeah, Bob? it's really a shame that Claude Rains is not around to see the fuss over Albert Bell. You remember, Rains was the French police inspector in the film Casablanca who was shocked to discover gambling at Bogey's Cafe as he pocketed his winnings. Corked bats, stuffed baseballs, they are not taught in the Boy Scout manual, but they're part of the national pastime. Now, corking bats, the most common way is just to bore open a canal here at the end of the bat, maybe go down uh, the size of a dime on the opening, maybe even a little bit smaller, and go down anywhere three to six inches, take the wood out, put in the cork or a light substance, maybe a Super Bowl or a bunch of little Super Bowls, then repair the end of the bat. You get a lighter bat. You then get more bat speed, and when players are caught, you get explanations that sound like a grown-up version of the dog ate my homework. With Albert Bell, you have the added intrigue out of Gordon Liddy when the bat vanished for a while. Cork bats and scuffed baseballs. Tonight's cover story. Doesn't everybody do it? Bell. Bend the rules to get that edge? In just about any major league clubhouse is somebody, usually a civilian, who, on be? request, will cork a bat. The use of cork bats is a lot less now than it was 15 years ago. I think in the, in the 70s it was much more prevalent. I mean, between the Super Bowls and the cork and all the different things they did, the tax that they tried. Reggie Jackson once had a tack bat in the year that he had 47 home runs that he got caught with in Boston. Nothing happened to him. There's a couple ways they could do it. Drilling straight down through the barrel, six to eight inches into the bat, emptying it out, putting in cork, uh, super balls, whatever they want, and closing it back up. Uh, we did a study as far back as 82 on this, and it really proved the ball does not go any further. From Burley Grimes' last legal spitball 60 years ago to the mischievous gyrations of Gaylord Perry, Albert Bell's pending suspension is not surprising, just the latest peek at baseball's rogue underside. This has been going on for a hundred years. It's been going on before I played and after I played, obviously. And, you know, it's just, it's kind of a gentleman's agreement, more or at least I thought it was, unless the guy's really blatant with it, then nothing's really done about it. Until someone gets caught. A 10-game suspension is, is a pretty stiff penalty compared to, the, to, the, to running out and throwing punches or going out and biting people. The sound of ash and horsehide is distinctive, and the White Sox thought it sounded off-key from Bell's booming bat. I thought it was probably wrong, but I figured I might, well, might as well check it and see what happens. Uh, once they took the bat, then I, I thought I was right. The next night, the Indians at umpires checked the glove of ex-Cleveland pitcher Dennis Cook. He was clean. No recent baseball crime was uncovered with more embarrassment than Billy Hatcher's cork bat breaking open seven years ago. Hatcher was suspended, his skipper held an air fine. Hatcher's explanation? I'm telling you right straight up now that, you know, I had no idea that the bat was court. They mess around with the bat, you know, doing it to hit in the dome, you know, they have their little game plan for beer and stuff, but it was just, just one of those situations, you know, if I didn't know it was corked or whatever, I would have never went up there to use it because, you know, I like to, you know, chop the ball down in the turf anyway. That was three weeks after Kevin Gross was caught with sandpaper in his glove. His explanation? Well, it was just something I was fooling with uh, just that week, and it was, just in my, it was just in my glove at the time when I was pitching. Did you scuff any balls? No, I did not scuff any balls last night. And that was one week after Joe Negro tried to discard his tools for changing aerodynamics. Umpire Steve Palermo's double tank was worthy of Johnny Carson. Gaylord Perry was never caught. After he retired, he admitted lubricating the baseball, but the mere suggestion was a tool for him while he pitched. You want him to think of a, a certain pitch, and, you know, it's like a uh, Nolan Ryan. They look for the fastball, he throws a curveball, they're not going to hit it. So I need all the help I can get. So if I can get him to think about something else, that's what I'm going to do. Doug DeCincey's hitting for the Angels in the 86 LCS brought a challenge on his back. The Boston Red Sox were claiming my bat is corked, and, and I take it as a compliment, really, because I don't cork my bats, and, and the ball does jump off my bat pretty crisply, and, and it comes from hitting the ball hard. And uh, But I did uh, decide that I had to go and cork one bat today and bring it on out here. And ladies and gentlemen, here is a corked bat. <laughs> those who scuff and those who cork are accepted quietly, and those who don't take the suggestion or the suspicion as the ultimate compliment. All right, the aerodynamics.